Hi guys, ever heard of Valerian? He rocked the Roman Empire as its emperor from 253 to spring 260 AD. But guess what? He made history by being the first emperor to get captured in a fierce showdown with the Persian Emperor Shapurai after the Battle of Edessa. This jaw-dropping twist sent shockwaves through the Roman Empire, sparking a roller coaster of reactions and weaving new tales about the empire's fate. His birth. Meet Valerian, not your average emperor contender. Unlike the wild bunch of wannabe emperors duking it out during the crisis of the third century, Valerian was the real deal, hailing from a noble and old-school senatorial family. Now, details about his early days are as rare as a comet sighting, but we do know he tied the knot with Ignatia Moreniana, popping out two heirs, Publius Licinius Ignatius Gallienus, his tag team co-emperor, and later, successor, and Licinius Valerianus. But wait, there's more. Picture this, Valerian, making waves as consul, first in the shadows before AD 238, then strutting as an ordinarius in 238. Fast forward to 251 AD, Decius, flexing censorship powers like never before, and guess who the Senate taps for the job? Valerian, that's who. But he pulls a Gandalf and declines the offer. Now, when Decius leaves Rome for a questionable campaign in Illyricum, who's left holding the fort? You guessed it, Valerian. But hold on to your laurel wreaths, because under Trebinus Gallus, Valerians handed the keys to an army ready for a Persian showdown. Plot twist, Emilianus rebels in 253 AD, and Valerian gets the call to crush the uprising. He dashes south, but alas, too late. Gallus bites the dust, troops defect, and the Raytheon soldiers give Valerian the golden ticket, an emperor's crown. September rolls around, Valerian swoops into Rome, and bam! Emilianus is toast, Valerian's emperor status is official, and the Senate does a quick salute. Rise and fall. Picture this, Valerian steps into the emperor's spotlight, and his first move is a family affair, he crowns his son Gallienus as co-emperor, tag-teaming the empire. But hold on, troubles brewing in Europe, sending the whole west into chaos. In the east, Antioch fell into Sassanid hands, and Shapur I was playing king of the castle in Armenia. Valerian and Gallienus decided to tag team the empire's problems with dad, jetting off to the east to tackle the Persian threat, while Sunny Boy dealt with the messy west. Both Valerian and Gallienus plays divide and conquer roles, as the sun tackles the wild west, while Pops handles the easy. Now, let's fast forward through Valerian's consulship stints in 254, 255, and 257. He's on a mission, reclaiming Antioch, wresting back control of Syria, and playing superhero against Gothic Havoc in Asia Minor. By 257 AD, he's reclaimed Antioch and brought Syria back into the Roman fold. But wait, the Goths decide to crash the party, wreaking havoc in Asia Minor in 258. In 259 AD, Valerian sets his sights on Edessa, but a pesky plague plays spoiler, taking out a chunk of his legionaries and leaving Rome vulnerable. To top it off, the Persians seize the opportunity and lay siege to Edessa. The climax hits in 260 AD, June, to be precise, as Valerian faces the Battle of Edessa, and spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. He's not just defeated, he's captured and spends the rest of his days in Persian custody. Talk about a colossal Roman defeat. Persecution of Christians. While fighting the Persians, Valerian sent two letters to the Senate ordering that firm steps be taken against Christians. The first, sent in 257 AD, commanded Christian clergy to perform sacrifices to the Roman gods or face banishment. The second, the following year, ordered the execution of Christian leaders. It also required Christian senators and equities to perform acts of worship to the Roman gods or lose their titles and property, and directed that they be executed if they continued to refuse. It also decreed that Roman matrons who would not apostatize should lose their property and be banished.
and that civil servants and members of the imperial household who would not worship the Roman gods should be reduced to slaves and sent to work on the imperial estates. This indicates that Christians were well established at that time, some in very high positions. The execution of St. Prudent at Narbonne is taken to have occurred in 257 AD. Prominent Christians executed in 258 included Pope Sixtus II, August 6th, St. Romanus Ostiarius, August 9th, and St. Lawrence, August 10th. Others executed in 258 AD included the Saints Denis in Paris, Pontius in Simeus, Cyprian and others in Carthage and Eugenia in Rome. In 259 AD, St. Patroclus was executed at Troyes and St. Fructuosus at Tarragona. When Valerian's son Gallienus became emperor in 260, the decree was rescinded. Death in Captivity Eutropius spilled the beans between 364 and 378 AD in his writing, painting a grim picture of Valerian, who got a one-way ticket to Parthian ignominy after Shapur, king of Persia, showed him the ropes of defeat. An early Christian source, Lactantius, thought to be virulently anti-Persian, thanks to the occasional persecution of Christians by some Sasanian monarchs, maintained that, for some time prior to his death, Valerian was subjected to the greatest insults by his captors. For example, being used as a human footstool by Shapur when mounting his horse. Historians have been locked in a debate about the true events, leaving us with more questions than answers. According to this version of events, after a long period of such treatment, Valerian offered Shapur a huge ransom for his release. In reply, Shapur was said to have forced Valerian to swallow molten gold. The other version of his death is almost the same, but it says that Valerian was killed by being flayed alive. After he was killed, they had him skinned and his skin was stuffed with straw and preserved as a trophy in the main Persian temple. It was further alleged that, it was only after a later Persian defeat against Rome that his skin was given a cremation and burial. The captivity and death of Valerian has been frequently debated by historians without any definitive conclusion. According to the modern scholar Turaj Derii, contrary to the account of Lactantius, Shapur I sent Valerian and some of his army to the city of Bishopur or Gundishapur where they lived in relatively good conditions. Shapur used the remaining soldiers in engineering and development plans. Bandi Kaisar, also known as Caesar's Dam, is one of the remnants of Roman engineering located near the ancient city of Susa. In all the stone carvings on Nagshrostum, in Iran, Valerian is represented holding hands with Shapur I, a sign of submission. According to the early Persian Muslim scholar Abu Hanifa Dinawari, Shapur settled the prisoners of war in Gundashapur and released Valerian, as promised, after the construction of Bandi Kaisar. It has been alleged that the account of Lactantius is colored by his desire to establish that persecutors of the Christians died fitting deaths. The story was repeated then and later by authors in the Roman Near East fiercely hostile to Persia. The joint rule of Valerian and Gallienus was threatened several times by usurpers. Nevertheless, Gallienus held the throne until his own assassination in 268 AD. Thanks for joining this epic historical journey. If you enjoyed unraveling the mysteries of Valerian's rise, fall, and intriguing captivity, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more captivating tales from the annals of history. Don't miss out on the next chapter, subscribe now and let the adventure continue.